All right, in this video, I want to illustrate something that I've already gotten into quite a few times in my videos where I bring up the scriptures. Now I want to actually illustrate it a bit here. You see, everybody is a sinner. We're all sinners, and we're all condemned, right? So that's what I have depicted here. Two different types of Christians. We got the Lordship Salvationist, and then we got true Christians over here. Both of them are sinners, so they're condemned, right? And I have quicksand here to represent how much time they have to actually accept Jesus. So this represents the two people before they accept Jesus. They're on the cross. Their quicksand represents their time. As soon as they go into the quicksand, they don't have any more time to accept Jesus. They're condemned. They go to hell. But until then, they're up on that cross, and they can accept Jesus at any time. Now, over here, the Christian accepts Jesus. The Lordship Salvationists claim they accept Jesus. Both still sin, yet only one of these people are forgiven. And I talk to these type of people all the time. The Catholics, Calvinists, Seventh-day Adventists. And I'll talk to them and I go, okay, Seventh-day Adventists, you say I need to keep the Ten Commandments to be saved. Because if I don't, I'm condemned and I go to hell. So I ask them, why is it that you're forgiven and I'm not, even though we both still sin? How come you get to get away with your sins, but I don't? And this is what it is, just silence. Maybe a couple of crickets. Because... Their answer says, I should be forgiven because I'm doing the works of the law. I should be forgiven because I'm trying to keep the commandments. So they're saying their works entitle them to forgiveness, entitle them to salvation. So that's how they actually end up denying Jesus over here. You see, what the Christian does is the Christian realizes there's nothing they can do. They're nailed to a cross. They're condemned on their way to hell. And they deserve it, and there's nothing they can do about it. Yet Jesus over here goes, hey, I got this righteous life in heaven. And you know what? I'll give it to you if you give me your life. And it's like, what? Are you serious? And the Christian's like, yeah, sure, no doubt, right, uh, sucker? <laughs> Take this life. It's worthless. So Jesus takes your life, he takes your place, and you get his life. And then you turn around when you're up here, and you see it's Jesus up there on that cross. And you see it slowly sink down. And you get a deep heartfelt respect for God, for what Jesus did. And from there, a love comes out of you towards God because he first loved you to take your place. And from there, you can actually truly love God and love other people. Because guess what? You're saved. As far as God's concerned... Your body's already been nailed to that cross. It's already been sent to hell. You still got, still got to deal with it for right now. But once you've done this, you've been reborn. Because what Jesus did was, in a sense, an act of spiritual labor to bring you into existence in the spiritual sense, where you're reborn not in the flesh, because once you accept Jesus, your flesh isn't reborn, obviously. It's your spirit. As a lot of Christians admit, Adam and Eve died spiritually when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What Jesus did gives us the spirit back. And that's what the circumcision is about. It's a spiritual circumcision where you have been cut from your flesh, your soul that's within you. Is that, that's what is your consciousness, your thoughts, your feelings, who you are, your personality. It's been cut from the, the flesh and has been put into the infant spirit that feeds off the milk of the word and grows. And you're attached to that body, not to the flesh. 
So even though the flesh still entices you to sin, as far as God's concerned, it's dead. And you're clothed in Jesus' righteousness because you're one flesh with him. When he sees you, he sees Jesus. Now that doesn't mean, like these people think, oh, you got a license to sin. No, actually you're saying there's a license to sin because if I sin, not only do I feel the tremendous guilt for it and I have my conscience eating at me, but God will chastise me. I'm not going to get away with it. And if I want to live in the sin, I want to follow the flesh, he'll just let me die. Because he's with me and he's not going to live that kind of life with me. So he'll just put the flesh down and take my spirit home. The worship salvationists, they still sin. And they think it's okay because they're trying not to. That's not biblical. There's nothing in the Bible that says, oh, try not to sin and you'll be forgiven. Try not to sin and you'll get eternal life. Try not to sin and everything's good. There's nothing like that. Nothing at all. So, I hope this explains it all. Makes it clear. You know, these two sinners come to Jesus. One accepts Jesus' sacrifice accepts Jesus as Savior. This one tries to make themselves co-Savior or even basically save themselves. Because they're like, yeah, not only do you have to have faith in God, but you have to add to his finished work. You need to now stop sinning. You need to now keep the law perfectly. Now you need to produce good works and fruit or else you're not saved. And it's all over here is all about trying to find a way to condemn you. Why? Because this actually is tied to the deeds and doctrines of the Nicolaitans, which means to conquer the people. And that's exactly what the churches do. You see, they put the clergy above everybody else, above the average churchgoer or average Christian, even if they don't go to church. And they make it seem as though you have to go to work into the world and then give them a portion of the actual profit you make. And not only that, you have to prove to them that you're truly saved. And that keeps you distracted from actually thinking about things, studying about things, and wondering why you're supporting this guy when he's the one that should be sacrificing everything for you and be giving to you. Because he's supposed to be a representation of Jesus. He's supposed to be an example to the flock. But instead, he guts you being a cash cow. You see, in the book of Acts, we read a couple of times where the tithes that were given were given by free will offering, but it was 100%. They gave everything. But guess what? It wasn't to support the clergy, the priests, and the pastors, and to build church buildings. It was used to support everybody in the church. You, me, everybody. Anybody who was in need... They helped them out. But that's not what's going on now. Now they have this set up. And if you're over on this side, you're a Christian. You've accepted Jesus. You're saved. So they can't guilt trip you. They can't control you with guilt and fear. They can't do that. Because you know you, you're secure. You're safe. You're in the arms of Jesus. you you got the only mediator right here. You're going straight to God. But they want you to go through them, to go through God. But guess what? You're both up on this cross here. You're both condemned, but they want you, for some reason, to go through here, to go to him. When these people, they can come off the cross by accepting Jesus. But instead, they want to stay on the cross and make it more comfortable by leeching off of you. So they want you to give them your tithes. They want you to give them your respect, your praises, your reverence, your obedience, instead of it all going to Jesus. That's why if anybody in the church, Catholic, Seventh-day Adventist, whatever Protestant denomination, if you need help, a lot of times you're just going to get some prayers. Or you're going to get them to do a, a food drive, a fundraiser of some kind. 
a bake sale, you know, whatever else they do to raise some money, to get more money to help you. But they're not going to give their own money to help you. No. All the money that everybody's been giving into the church, they're keeping that for themselves. It's not for you. You're supposed to give it to them so that they can tell you that you're a sinner and you're damned because you're not perfect. And that's the thing. None of us are perfect. They're not perfect. Yet they're getting on you for not being perfect. So that's why I always say, how come you're forgiven and I'm not? Because that's how they act. They act as though I'm forgiven and I'm just and holy and I'm going to heaven. But you, you're not. Why? Well, I'm trying not to sin. Okay, but you're still sinning. So you shouldn't get punished for your sins because you're trying not to? And as if I'm going all out trying to sin? But either way, if you're trying not to sin and you sin, you're just as guilty as somebody who willfully goes and sins. So there's no reason why you should be forgiven and an outright just deliberate sinner shouldn't be. There's no reason why one of you should be given and the other one not, other than accepting Jesus. So, I hope that uh, illustrates it well enough and gets the point out. And actually, when you're talking to these Lordship Salvationists, you ask what you ask, should ask them. We both keep on sinning. Why should you be forgiven and I'm not? You know, how, how does that work? And that's how you can get down to the bottom of it, that it's just a guilt trip. They tried to put you in a state of guilt and fear and shame so they can manipulate you and control you. It's the same thing the government does with what they're doing now. They put this guilt and shame and fear into you by what's going on and by you not obeying them and whatnot to end up manipulating to, you to control you. Because when you're in that state, you want a remedy. When you're in a state of fear and guilt, you want the remedy. And they give you what I would say is not the cure, but something to cover up the symptoms for a week until you come back the next week. And then they'll cover it up, and then they'll just do that week by week so that you keep coming in, giving your ties, giving your respect, giving your adoration. You're going over here to get a little bit of comfort instead of going over here and finding true peace. So, let's just, I'm going to actually draw that out. So, don't do this. I'm going to put, no, don't do that. Because some of you, yes, do that. I can't actually see that. There we go. So, there you go. Go to Jesus. Go straight to God. He loved you enough to come into this world to take your place and die for you. You don't think he's going to take the time to listen to you? Hear you out? Help you out? Why are you going to this jackass? The thing is, say this is the lay people, the people of the church, and this is the clergy, the pastors and priests. You're on equal level here. You're both sinners condemned. Nobody's above anybody else here. But they want you to think they're up here, and you're down here, and you need to obey them and listen to them to be able to get the respect and blessings from God. You need to snap out of that. You really do. Uh, but anyway, I, I think I can say it like a few more times in a different way, I guess. But, yeah, I, I think you get it. I hope you get it. I mean, it's simple. I think a child can grasp what's going on here. But anyway, thanks for watching and take care.